Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here at the Nixon Library, and thanks to all you for being here and for the folks at the library for hosting me. Um, it's always good to be among friends and among fellow, I assume, embattled conservatives, right, since you're conservatives here in, in California. I know a thing or two about what it's like to be embattled. A conservative is some, uh, a very right-wing guy who lives and works in New York City. Um, I used to live in Union Square in New York, which was the very epicenter of Obama mania in 07 and 08. And I still remember on election night, I was up late at Fox doing commentary 2008, and like two or three in the morning, I went back home. I was, you know, tired, worn out, irritable, depressed. Um, and it was here at Union Square, very close to New York University, it was like we had won a war. Uh, the streets were thronged, people were chanting, singing, banging on pots, uh, randomly high-fiving people walking down the sidewalk, including me, you know, little, little did they know. And uh, whenever uh, I encounter these kind of uh, um, liberal youth, I'm reminded of uh, a Reagan story when he was governor here in California and uh, at a time when protests oftentimes spontaneously broke out and he apparently was at a meeting of the Board of Trustees of the University of California. And while he was there, uh, a demonstration started at the front of the building, and a staff wanted to sneak out the back. He said, no, I'm going to go, go right through them. So he walks through the uh, protesters, gets in his car, and you know, they're kind of scruffy, hippie-looking types, maybe you know, haven't bathed very recently. And they start banging on the car and chanting, we are the future. We are the future. And the story goes that Reagan cracks the window a little bit and says, well, in that case, I'm going to sell my bonds. <laughs> um, I've, I've written this book on Lincoln, uh, as you know now, which has been out about a week. And I've had some interesting experiences. One of them, I, my wife and I live in New York City in a doorman building. And one of our doormen, great guy, immigrant from Ireland, um, very hardworking, just had a kid, from what I can tell, basically has conservative instincts through uh, things you hear him uh, randomly say. So I, I give him this book, and he's delighted to get it, and he's, oh, this is wonderful. And then he says, wait a minute, you wrote a book about Lincoln? I thought you were a Republican. <laughs> and he, he meant this, this wasn't a jibe, right? He wasn't trying to get at me. This was a sincere inquiry. <laughs> which I think tells us uh, how much we need to do to save uh, the true uh, legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And that's what I want to discuss with you a little bit um, tonight, because progressives have been after Abraham Lincoln for about 100 years, started with TR, FDR was very uh, intense on this, and Barack Obama has been even more intense, right? He announces for president in Springfield before the old uh, state House there. He takes the oath on the uh, Lincoln Bible. I believe someone told me, I haven't independently confirmed this, but that he's mentioned Abraham Lincoln 230 times or something since he's been president. And I, I just think it's, it's very important for us to get Abraham Lincoln right, because if you get Lincoln right, then you get America right, uh, and you get what sh I believe should be our an animating purpose as conservatives. So, <clears throat> By way of introduction, I think there are common misconceptions of Lincoln. We tend to think of him as uh, a man of the earth, uh, this kind of accidental president, a tribune of the common people and common sense. And I think that really underestimates him, and he wouldn't be surprised by that because he was underestimated throughout his life. And part of it was just very superficial. It was the way he looked, this ungainly character. He, he said once in the White House that he, he um, had the insight that God must love common-looking people more than anyone else because he made more of them. Um, but he was common-looking. But uh, anyone who has um, judged him on the basis of his looks or thought any of those things I just mentioned about him was making a grave mistake. This is a ferociously ambitious man, and an ambitious man um, from his very youth, really, possessed of an exceptional and extraordinary 
intelligence. Again, evident from the time of his youth, people would report that he, he was very curious about politics when he was young, and he would borrow newspapers. And when he'd return them, he'd be able to basically recite entire editorials line by line. Just an incredible uh, memory. And then he had you know, a wisdom about the world, a judgment about things and about human nature. Um, I, I love a little story he used to tell when he was trying to um, illustrate how if you try to change people's behavior on the promise of a far-off reward or on the threat of a far-off um, uh, um, something bad that's going to happen to you, you're not really going to get very far. And he used to say there is this Irishman who stole a spade and someone uh, went to him and said, uh, Patty, you know, they used politically incorrect language then, you know, you're going to have to pay for that when you meet the end of your days and you meet your maker. And the Irishman says, well, in that case, if you're going to credit me that long, I think I'll take another. Um, so Lincoln, one of the reasons he knew so much about human nature was he just, the, the kind of life he led and how roughed up he was by life. He had the most inauspicious beginnings you can imagine. He's born in Kentucky, moves to Indiana, literally in uh, the middle of nowhere, literally in a log cabin. And there are reports uh, in that area that people who had log cabins at night, when they had fires in the cabins, they would see the shining eyes of bears peering in at them uh, outside. There is a, a story about a, uh, a little girl who in this area uh, was killed by a panther because her brother wasn't able to kill the panther with a hatchet to the skull fast enough. Okay, so this is not suburban bliss. This is a, a very um, unforgiving environment. Lincoln said he had, a put, he had an ax put in his hand almost at once, and he handled that most useful instrument, instrument until about the age uh, 23. But one of the great ironies of Lincoln's life is that he didn't like axes. He didn't like splitting rails, even though we know him as the rail splitter. He wanted to escape uh, this unforgiving uh, environment. His, his mother, at a very young age, and his aunt and his uncle came down with something that was called milk sick. A cow would wander off into the forest, would eat poison weeds. Its milk would become poisoned. No one would know this. You would drink the milk, and you would die an indescribably horrible death in about a week. So this happens to his mom. I think he's about eight or so. He has to um, fashion the, the wood coffin with his father to bury her. There's no, no one to give a sermon. Um, eventually, uh, someone, a minister, happened by the uh, area you know, months later. And um, his sister would die in childbirth, which was not uncommon. And Lincoln's family was very upset about this, thought, the in-laws didn't do enough to hate her, to help her. The in-laws said, well, uh, we wanted to help her, but the nearest doctor was too drunk to help her, which again gives you an idea of uh, this way of life. And Lincoln said there was nothing to excite an ambition for education in this time and in this place. His mother signed her name with an X. His stepmother, who was very caring and was a, a great blessing to him, she signed her name with an X. His father could barely sign his name. Lincoln said he could bunglingly sign his name, which is, there's a note of a trace of contempt in that uh, description. There were schools, but a, huge, a big part of what instructors did was to beat the kids, okay? Um, there's a, Lincoln told a story in the White House that kind of captured what the educational environment um, was like. He said there is this, this schoolroom of kids, and they're reading from the book of Daniel, now you have to cast your mind way back into this mid-19th century context when it was actually legal to read the Bible in a schoolroom in America. And they're reading from the book of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And this one boy stumbles over the name Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, right? Anyone could do that. I probably couldn't, didn't say them uh, correctly myself. Boom, hit, hit up against the head. So they, they're go reading, continuing to read the passage. And the kid's kind of calculating in his head. And he's seeing how many kids are left till it comes back around to him. And he's looking ahead to the lion, seeing, and he just starts whimpering again. And the instructor's like, now, now what? Now what's wrong? Now, you know, why you're crying? He's like, master, there come those three damn fellows again. <laughs> he probably got hit again. So 
Lincoln wants to escape this, okay? This is all, this is, might be charming to us. It might, for us, speak very well of him that he came from this, but everything in his life was geared to escaping this. If you want